Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem step-by-step -step directions from a binary tree node to another. The idea is we're given the root of a binary, well it's not a binary source tree, it's just a regular binary tree and that's very important. So there's no sorted property with this tree and we're also given a start value and a destination value. So both of these nodes are guaranteed to exist in the list. So I think this is actually the start, this is the end. Both of them are guaranteed to exist. They're both guaranteed to be different. And we want to find the shortest path from one to the other. Now, shortest path, that's not exactly going to be the hard part because the straightforward path will be the shortest path. So it's not like we're going to do something like that. We're just going to go here. We do have some pretty nice examples this time because there's a couple things to notice. In the first example, there's the root node and this is the node that connects the shortest path. That may not always be the case. Suppose um, this was the start and this was the target. Then this is the shortest path. Doesn't necessarily go through the root. So that's something to keep in mind. Now from this example, if you've solved a few other leak code uh, tree problems, you might have an idea. Look, at the common node connecting them. There's going to be some node that the path runs through. Maybe if we can find that node, then we can find the connection between them. And that's actually very valid. You're thinking of, I think the leak code problem is called lowest common ancestor. And uh, the only reason I actually know that is because it is one of the famous problems in my uh, Neat Code 150 list. And I have a pretty deep understanding of these 150 problems. And I always tell people that if you have a really deep understanding of a small subset of really good problems, you know, then you can potentially solve thousands of problems because there is a lot of overlap between them. Now, admittedly, the problem we're solving today is definitely more difficult than this one. This one is relatively straightforward. But still, if you can find the lowest common ancestor between them, it seems like there's probably a solution because then we can you know, find a path to the node in one subtree. It's either gonna be the start or the destination and the other subtree, we can find the other value. There is one edge case though, and thankfully the second example actually does make it pretty clear. It could be possible that this, like the node that we said, the parent node that the path has to run through, it could be either the start or the target, or the start or the destination, sorry. Because look at the second example. One node is a parent of the other. We don't have to worry about the case where both nodes are the same, that's never gonna happen. But one could technically be a parent of the other. So if I'm being completely honest with you, even though I realize that the lowest common ancestor might be able to solve this problem for us, I didn't really think too deeply about how it could do that because off the top of my head, it just seemed like it, even if it's possible, it's gonna be kind of painful to code up. So I thought like, okay, I know that this probably could help me solve the problem, but let me try to think if there is a potentially easier way because we only have two nodes. I thought, okay, if I can, from the root, somehow run a search algorithm. We can't do like the regular binary search tree traversal, which would generally run in log n time because we have like a sorted binary search tree. We can't do that for the start and destination values. We do have to do a brute force depth first search or backtracking, whatever you wanna call it. You have to kind of go through the entire uh, tree. But if we can do that, if we can find the value, the node with a value three, let's get a path to that node. and maybe we can also get a path to the destination node. And before I go any further, let me explain what we're actually returning. Which in order to connect these two nodes, the path has to be returned in a very specific way. We start at the start value, so it's not symmetrical. We can't like give a path like this. I mean, technically you could, and then maybe you could reverse it or you know, do some kind of processing after the fact. But let's stick with the straightforward way for now. We have to start here, we have to end here. And basically, when we're moving up, we use the character U. So we go up obviously here, we go up obviously there, and then to get to the destination, we go right, and then we go left. So it looks to me that the path is gonna be up, up, right, left. That is the result for this problem. So now, how do we get there? Well, intuitively, before I even wrote it out, I kind of knew that, okay, now it's all starting to make sense. The lowest common ancestor actually is gonna be useful for us. Watch this, because 
Actually, let me think of some better examples. I'm going to be constantly changing like what the start and end node is in this example just to kind of make it clear because we're going to go through several different you know scenarios. This is just kind of a small binary tree for us to illustrate several examples. But the idea is this. Suppose this is the start and suppose this is the target. The path to the start is going to be uh, left, left. The path to the target is going to be right, right. So now that we have that, we have the path to the start is left, left. We have the path to the target is right, right. How do we get it in the form that we want? The result, the correct result should actually be up, up, right, right. How do we get it into that form? Well, basically, it's actually pretty easy, isn't it? We just take the path to the start node and replace every one of these with the up character, at least in this example, right? It doesn't matter whether we went left or right. Let me change the example for a second. Let me say that actually this was the start node. So actually the path was left, right. And now the path to the destination is still right, right. That doesn't change anything. We still have to go up twice. The result is still up, up, right, right, at least in this kind of example. Now, let me give you a counter example where that doesn't work. Let me give you this example. Uh, this is the start. And this is the target. Path to the start is going to be left, left. Path to the target is going to be left, right. So the first path to the uh, start is left, left. Path to target is left, right. Now, are you kind of noticing anything? Like I said, lowest common ancestor. Do you think we can find the lowest common ancestor from these inputs? Of course we can. We have a pointer that iterates character by character. We compare if the two characters are the same, obviously from the root, we're going to the same node. So it's not until we find the first differing character that we have found the lowest common ancestor. Until that point, we are basically going in the same direction to find both of them. Okay, how does that help us solve the problem though? Well, basically we, as we iterate that pointer, we ignore these. I don't care about it from the first or the second array because now what we can say is that the result is going to be up, right. So I take every remaining character from the first array and replace it with a U and I just take everything from here and concatenate it to that. So the result is up, right. We're getting very close. Just a couple more edge cases to consider. Remember the case, of course, where suppose uh, this is the start and suppose this is the destination. Okay, to get to the start is gonna be left, left. To get to the destination is just gonna be one left. Okay, so now it's kind of tricky. The arrays are of different size. We're still gonna follow the same idea though. Go character by character. These two are clearly the same. Okay, so now wherever we ended, we're at the lowest common ancestor. Do the same damn thing. Okay, I don't know why I said damn, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, take this, everything remaining from here, replace it with a U. Take everything remaining here, concatenate it. Uh, that's it, literally, that's it. Just go up once, this is the result. Try to do the opposite. This is the start node, the parent is the start, and the child is the destination. How does that work? Well, to get to the start, we have one left. To get to the destination, we have two lefts. Same thing. Uh, go character by character. These are the same. Boom. Okay, we ran out of characters from here. So what do we do? Replace everything with a U. There's nothing left. Take everything here, concatenate it to that. So this is the result. Left. From start, go left. That's it. I think we've pretty much ran through every example. If there's one last example you wanted to try yourself, maybe try uh, something like this, where the uh, arrays are going to be of different lengths. Maybe uh, this is the start and this is the destination. Try that out. Maybe try flipping them. But I think you'll find that the algorithm that we're using works the same. So in summary, we're going to run a DFS to find the path that gives us the start. That's gonna be big O of N because we do have to potentially go through the entire um, tree because first, you know, from here, we're gonna try looking over here. Is the start somewhere here? It might not be, then we might have to go to the right side. So we're gonna have to do that twice to find the path to the start and the destination. But once we have those paths, the solution is gonna be kind of trivial. Like I said, we're just gonna be kind of concatenating those two arrays. And in terms of space complexity, I think it's also gonna be O of N just if we're counting like the output, like those arrays I was talking about, especially, that's probably going to be the bottleneck. But in any case, this is pretty efficient, I think.
Okay, so let's get into it. First, I'm gonna start with that helper function that I talked about, DFS. It's going to obviously keep track of what current node that we're at. We're gonna keep track of what current path we're at. And also to make this extensible, because we're gonna use it twice, we wanna know what target are we looking for. We're gonna pass in this the first time and this the second time to get the path to each of those nodes. And if you're still not convinced to use Python yet, I bet uh, this solution I'm about to show you might convince you. Honestly, sometimes I'm surprised by how easy Python makes things. But first of all, if we reach null, so if not node, let's return an empty string. An empty string is evaluated as false in Python, and we're gonna use that to our advantage. So just keep that in mind. The other thing is, of course, if we actually reach the target, if the value is at the target, then let's return the current path that we are maintaining, is the recursive step. We don't know where the result could be. It could be either on the left side or the right side. So let's run a DFS on both sides, node.left, uh, passing in the path, passing in the target and doing the same thing for the right side. Now, obviously it's not gonna be this simple. We do have to keep track of what the path is. So if we're going left, well, first of all, let me change this to right. But if we're going left, we should probably say path.append the character left. At the very least, we should do that. And then before we go to the right side, we should probably pop that. We should say path.pop that character that we just appended here and replace it with a right character. Okay getting closer, but at what point are we gonna return the result? Like we're looking for a particular node. If we find it from this path, then we should return. We don't really need to do the second recursive call. How do I know that? Well, based on my base cases here, if the result is non-null or non-empty, like a non-empty string, then we have the result. So I'm actually going to take the return value of the first recursive call, assign it to a variable, which I'm gonna call the result. And if result is true, then I'm going to return that result. So this is the first recursive step. Pretty much the same thing for the second one. So get the result here, and then if it's non-empty, go ahead and return it. I'm only putting this if statement on the same line just because I don't want to run out of like vertical space. I want to be able to show all of this to you at a single time. But you know, it's not a big deal if you take this and put it on the next line. I don't really care. Now you might be thinking, in which case is neither of these going to return? Like why do we need out here another return statement where I return an empty string? And even uh, more than that, why do I need to do this? Why do I need to say path.pop? Well, think of it this way. Suppose we start at the root here. Suppose three is the target. Well, we're gonna get to two eventually, then we're gonna go left, it's not the result. Then we're gonna come back to two, then we're gonna go right, it's still not the result. Well, then we need to pop back up and pop back up here, and then we need to go to the right side. That's why even though we don't find the result in the right subtree or the left subtree from this current node, we still might have the result somewhere else in the tree. So that's just the example I wanted to make it clear. Okay, now for the easy part, to be honest, let's call DFS, pass in the root, pass in an empty list, and pass in the start value. Do the same, do the same thing with the destination value. Let's maintain the result of each of these in a separate variable. I'll call it start path and I'll call it destination path. And now remember what we wanna do is find the first differing character. I'm gonna have a pointer, i is gonna be zero. I'm gonna say while i is less than, we don't want it to go out of bounds. So we don't know which one of these lists is shorter. So I'm gonna take the length of the first one and the length of the second one. And then I'm gonna take the minimum between them like this. And I probably could add like a second condition in the loop here itself, like in the condition itself, but I'm just gonna put it inside just for readability. So I'm gonna say if the character is not equal to the one in the other array as well, if there is a different character, let's go ahead and break out of the loop. Otherwise, don't forget to increment your pointer. At the very least, you'll need this line inside of your loop. But you know, if I wanted to put this condition um, outside of this loop, I could get rid of this, I could put it over here, and I could change this to an equal. So while they're equal, continue. Basically, this is the inverse of this one. So anyways, almost done with this. Scroll down. Now you might be thinking, well, 
how can we code this up? In most languages, you'll probably need a loop to do it, but Python, it just makes it so easy. You're not even gonna believe it. The result is gonna be this. Um, how many U's do we need? We need this many U characters. Basically, how many characters are remaining in the start path? Well, I'm gonna take basically the length of start path starting from index I. It could technically have zero characters remaining, and believe it or not, then, if this was zero and we're multiplying zero by this, that would result in an empty array. So this is the first portion. This tells us how many steps up we need to go. The second portion I'm gonna add to this is what are the characters remaining in the destination path? It could be empty or there could be some characters in it. Basically just take dest path, do the slice starting from I, just like that in Python, and this is your result. Why do I even need to assign it to a variable when I can just go ahead and return it like this? So I know I did a few like Python tricks in this video. I don't think most of them are gonna be crazy to translate into other languages. Like you're, you'll just need extra code to do it, to be honest. It's not that it's difficult. It's just gonna be more verbose for you probably. Oh, actually I did uh, forget something. That's kind of embarrassing. So we actually don't wanna return it in the form of a list. So we wanna return it as a string. And thankfully Python makes that pretty easy as well. I didn't do that on purpose, by the way that mistake I'm talking about. Um, so we can do this, uh, an empty string dot join with the list that we passed in here. Um, if you if it makes it clear, I can maybe put this into a variable at this point, I guess. That's assigned a result, and then we pass result in here, and then that's what we end up ultimately returning. I'll run this. You can see it works and it's pretty efficient. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, check out neatcode.io. I plan on launching Python for coding interviews tonight. Perfect timing if you're trying to learn any of these tips and tricks I showed in this video. Hopefully I'll see you soon.